Was A Quiet Place inspired by signs it comes at night in War for the Planet of the Apes? Was Ready Player One influenced by Avatar, Wreck-It Ralph, and The Last Starfighter? Is the Hurricane Heist more influenced by Sharknado or Geostorm? These are the kinds of questions my guest co-hosts and I discuss on my podcast, Piecing It Together. Every week, we look at a new movie and try to figure out what other movies inspired it, whether it's the story, the character development, tone, or even use of music. Every movie was influenced by something that came before, and we want to figure out what. Check out Piecing It Together on your favorite podcast app or check us out on piecingpod.com. You can also follow us on social media at piecingpod. Piecing It Together is a part of the All Points West Podcast Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Not Just New Movies podcast, the show where we review a seemingly random film currently not in theaters. My name is Ben Pierce, and then today we're going to be talking about Steve Miner's 1982 film, Friday the 13th, Part 3, just in time for this episode to actually be released on Friday the 13th. Uh, joining me is my regular co-host, Tyler. How are you? I'm doing good, Ben. I'm just uh, a little uneasy. I feel like I feel like someone's in the room with us. I oh, my God. Had that as well. Wait, oh, who is that? Oh, hey guys. Hey, how, how you guys doing? Uh, Tyler, I, I know that we had talked about having a guest. You didn't book Jason Voorhees for this episode, did you? No, this is David Rosen. How you doing, David? Hey, I'm doing all right, guys. So, so happy to be here. David Rosen, the host of the Piecing It Together podcast. David, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, tell people a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, well, I am a podcaster, a music composer, and uh, on Piecing It Together, what we do is we take a look at movies through the lens of what other movies might inspire them. And uh, I've got Tyler coming up on an episode about Friday the 13th, the entire series, actually. So uh, that's going to be a fun episode. And I'm looking forward to talking about this particular entry here on the show today. Very cool. So uh, if you guys are listeners who are joining us for the first time, welcome to the show. You can find all of our previous episodes at njnmpodcast.blogspot.com. And if you would like to contact us, you can do that by email at notjustnewmovies at gmail.com. This is the second episode in our newest mini series, which is called NJNM (laughs) to the third power, like (laughs) with the number three as like a superscript, I think is the technical term. Um, So this series uh, covers movies that have the number three in the title or that are the third entry in a franchise. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, Tyler, do you want to just like skip all of our old nonsense where we used to play games and whatnot and just jump right into a discussion of Friday the 13th part three? I kind of wanted David to talk a little bit about his music because I listened to a few tracks on Bandcamp, but I'm sure there's a way Mm -hmm. to find his music if he wants to. uh, It feels like almost like um, like some movie soundtracks a la John Carpenter's. Ooh, thank Um, you. But, I, I uh, love if you want to explain it a little more. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I compose music for films and absolutely uh, composing for horror and very like synth based horror type stuff is definitely my bag. And like my my albums that I put out, the stuff that's on Bandcamp and also on iTunes and Spotify and all those places uh, is very inspired by my film scoring work, um, but also by a lot of like alternative music and uh, electronica and a really a wide range of inspirations I kind of blend together into the stuff that I put out. But uh, definitely uh, John Carpenter's music has been a major influence on me, a lot of industrial music. And so, yeah, uh, the, I have six main albums and three special bonus albums that are also available. Uh, the most recent one is just self-titled, actually. It's called David Rosen. And uh, yeah, you can check out all of my music at bydavidrosen.com with links to the uh, you know iTunes and all that stuff. And I also put out music videos. Uh, there's a couple horror inspired ones. People, fans of the Friday the 13th series will definitely get a kick out of some of those things. And uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, so Tyler, do you want to uh, insert the trailer yeah, for Friday the 13th part three? The trailer will not be in 3D, but let's run it and then uh, get into it. <laughs> We 
weekends are a good time to escape to the woods. Unless the weekend begins with Friday the 13th. Because 13 is an unlucky number. But out here, so are 1 through 12. Because these are Jason's woods. And nobody leaves them alive. Friday the 13th, part 3 in 3D. All right, so I want to start things off by asking you, David, what is your relationship to the Friday the 13th franchise? I know that you, you mentioned you and Tyler are going to be talking about the franchise as a whole on an upcoming episode of your podcast. But uh, I guess in, in an effort to not necessarily step on the same exact, uh, you know, uh, territory that you guys are going to be covering later, um, what, what is your relationship to this film franchise? So I've always considered myself in the great debate between, you know, Freddie, Jason and Michael Myers. I've always been a Jason guy. But the funny thing is, is I, I never really dug in deep to the franchise until just a couple of weeks ago. I watched all of them. And I, I as I was watching them, I was trying to figure out which ones I'd actually seen. I know for sure I'd seen four. Uh, I, I know for sure I'd seen Freddie versus Jason. But in between, I, I don't know. Uh, I think I'd seen the first one as well. But I just always like Jason, the character. I just think as a horror icon, I think he's just kind of like the perfect version of of what a horror slasher character can be. And so I, I've always just loved the series, even though I'd never really watched them all. And just rewatching or watching for the first time uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I'm glad I picked him because these movies are pretty damn fun. <laughs> so I know I had only seen the first two entries in this franchise okay. um i don't think i've seen any beyond uh I, actually i i remember seeing freddy versus jason in theaters and that's it but that's like kind of a friday the 13th movie but not really it's like its own kind right. of weird thing um Excellent. so tyler i know that you're you're probably more in this uh you know the friday the 13th movies are definitely more in your wheelhouse than mine so what have you seen all of the movies at this point too i, I think i have and uh one of the jumping off points of forcing David to have me on his show was the, um, the fan films, these womp stomp film company, um, I guess, YouTube fan films dedicated to the series and kind of a one-off, but continuation. And so, uh, I got really excited about those around October, but, uh, the series as a whole, I find Jason to be the funniest, horror character i think there's a lot of comedy there considering he can get himself into some situational uh comedy at points especially by the sixth installment it kind of knows who it's playing to and it's playing it for laughs um three is a is a gimmick (laughs) but i feel like one and two actually had some sense of horror i guess even though it was schlock I think it did try to be scary, but by part six, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much a comedy at that point. I think, <laughs> Almost I, think a parody that's the main, itself. I think that's the main thing about three is that it is the beginning of starting to recognize Jason for the comedy that he could be. Um, like there's just a couple of moments here and there, but it is starting to play with that. So talk about that a little bit more. What did you guys find, uh, I guess, humorous about Jason in this specific entry? Hmm. I mean, I, I would say some of the deaths are like, you know, uh, to use a spear gun is absolutely ridiculous. Like like this big giant guy who hacks people with a machete is going to just shoot a spear gun all of a sudden. I mean, it's pretty great. Uh, you know, um, the end. I mean, of course, this I assume spoilers all around oh, yeah. in this conversation. But yeah. the end when when Jason finally gets it in, in in the head, but then goes into the zombie walk for a second. I think is pretty you know <laughs> yeah. humorous. You know, there's little moments like that. There's there's a part of the very beginning where they're recapping part two, and she goes into the you know the Voorhees mansion, aka a shack in the woods, and. <laughs> like through the tiny window, you can see him kind of running through the forest up into the house. And I just cackle every time I see that (laughs) because he's just like a tiny little speck and he's just got his pillowcase on his head and he's just kind of running towards her. Um, 
it makes me laugh. So maybe it's uh, maybe it was earlier in the franchise than I thought. So let's talk about the mask thing. You mentioned the pillowcase, uh, Tyler. I yeah. think this, this movie is like most famous for introducing the hockey mask as part of Jason's iconography. And I know that was a big uh, sort of selling point for you. Um, and and I guess as somebody who's you know sort I of di- taken a deeper dive into this franchise than I have, uh, w- what does that iconography mean to you for, for this character? Well, I was kind of ashamed because on, on David's show, I said that he got the like the cut in his mask in part four, but it was actually this part three where he got the axe to the face or the axe to the head. Mm. But I don't know if it's like iconic for me because I didn't start watching these movies till, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, whenever I started going back and they were made available on streaming. Um, but it, it is kind of weird to think before this, like Jason Voorhees was just kind of a guy with the holes cut out of a pillowcase. But when we were in school or when we were talking about Jason Voorhees as, as young kids, it was the hockey mask version. And that has been parodied so much that it, it you kind of think, well, why isn't he in the first one? Why isn't he wearing a hacky mask in the second one? And it's kind of, it's kind of interesting to think there was a time where it wasn't the joke yet. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, Dave, do you have any thoughts about the hockey mask and what it might like add to the character's mystique or anything like that? <laughs> well, the one, the one thing that it's making me think of is uh, in Tyler's conversation with me on on my piecing it together podcast. I, I made the rather bold claim of saying the MCU was inspired by Friday the Thirteenth, and, and uh, now that I'm thinking about it, I didn't think about this during our conversation, but the hockey mask changes in every entry. And then if you think about it, Iron Man is always a little bit different in every entry of the MCU. Mm -hmm. So there's another uh, comparison that we could add to that conversation. (laughs) I also like the idea of the writer's room for three where they're like, well, what can we do with Jason this time? He's got to be, we got to get him into team sports. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I just like, you know, as somebody who has um, not too much of an association with this character beyond the first two movies, I, I just found it so strange that the... Um, perhaps the defining uh, visual characteristic of this guy, aside from like the fact that he's like this hulking presence and maybe like the the mm-hmm. giant Hulk. knife that he always carries, um, or the machete rather, is that um, the the defining I guess costume uh, element of this character came from this other character of Shelley, who is yeah. like this just total <laughs> right. like bizarre. Uh, <laughs> You know, um, douchebag. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, he he bursts out of the water to prank uh, the Vera character, and he's wearing the mask. And I'm like, first of all, where did he get this? Like, he must have found this in in the you know the cabin shack or whatever. And then like, why did he think it was a good idea to put this hockey mask on to go underwater? Like, it's not like a a diving mask or something. I just don't understand the origin of it. It's like they they came across the idea and then like forced their way, you know, like found some way to uh, to really force it into the movie and make sense. Um, but I think, uh, I think I, it's implied that he has all of his prank goodies in that little suitcase from the beginning. So I assume but, but everything he uses. Part of that? We, we could have gotten more? a very different Jason if he picked a different thing out of his bag. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Like yeah, a Mardi the, Gras mask or something? <laughs> the possibilities are endless. Um, so, uh, Tyler, I want to I sort of like open the floor to you. Like, how do you want to approach this conversation? We've talked about like some of the, the big aspects of this movie. But like, do you want to sort of do like a... a you know, an overview of it, like almost beat for beat or like, how do you want to talk about this? Yeah, we can do that, but let's talk about the 3d first. It's, uh, is it good? (laughs) Is it good? Well, I didn't watch it on a 3d TV or, uh, you can tell when when it's 3d time. Definitely tell the, the snake, the baseball bat. I mean, there are several moments where it's like dreaded baseball bat. (laughs) The camera just uh, really stops and like the entire movie stops almost and pauses and is like, hey, look at this. Look at this thing we're doing. Right, like, right. I don't know. I, I can't really put myself in the place of an audience member in 1982. And, and it's very tough for me to think about this in a way that isn't like, um, you know, that doesn't have a little bit of cynicism attached to it. I can't mm. imagine like sitting there and just being like, wow, this is a genuinely cool thing. But maybe I'm just, uh, you know, maybe I'm too jaded. Um, David, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, it definitely didn't feel cool, but I did <laughs> laugh every time. And so that kind of added to the humor, whether it was intentional or not. It definitely gave me a laugh every time. It was like so clearly obvious they were trying to hold on a 3D moment. Uh, and, and I don't know, it kind of adds to like a very like kitschiness, you know? Do you guys remember when Home Improvement had a 3D episode and like Tim Taylor would like take a two by four and just like stick it at the TV for laughs? Wow. That's, uh, that's all I no. think about every time I see it in a 3D movie. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's interesting. Um, I was reading on the Wikipedia page for this movie, and it says that uh, actor Larry Zerner, who played Shelley, uh, he recalled <laughs> that perfecting the 3D effects often superseded the actor's performances. And he, he quotes here, <laughs> it, it quickly be- uh, became clear that most of the time the performances didn't matter. When we were shooting the scene at the convenience store with the gang members and I had to throw a wallet at the camera, it was hit the camera. Then after 10 takes, it was hit the camera, asshole. <laughs> and then uh, actress Tracy Savage echoed this sentiment saying it didn't matter how the lines were delivered (laughs) so they really put a a huge prioritization on the 3d effects which is like strange to hear the actors talk about that because there really aren't that many instances of it right like there's probably only what six or seven or something that stood out to me anyway maybe it it was a little bit more subtle or or maybe the effects uh, came through a little bit more like theatrically but uh, you know watching it streaming now um it, it seemed to me that there there were only a handful of these moments yeah, less 3D moments than there are kills. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And I think this movie is supposed to be like uh, one of the the uh, highest body counts of the Friday the 13th franchise. Is that right? Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I think maybe. I did think it. I did think I do think that's interesting because the acting in this is better than one and two because I feel like one and two is kind of like a student film. Qual- not to rag on student films, but like maybe one or two takes and then Mm -hmm. this one like especially at the beginning like the characters are just saying stuff to say stuff like just just to fill the quiet of the world Mm -hmm. (laughs) where you know normal people would just kind of you know move about their day everyone's got to say something (laughs) and it's kind (laughs) of like a comic book where you know every speech bubble has to be filled with some content it isn't even like dialogue that explains stuff it's just you know, like, oh, I bet my bottom dollar that we'll be there in an hour or whatever. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Who cares? Well, especially the the very beginning, like, or I guess right after the the replay of the ending of part two, like the, I guess the, the proper opening of this movie is like the, you know, this Crystal Lake diner, yeah. the, you know, kind of whatever weird ha- house slash diner setup they've got going with this husband and wife. And she's just like this awful nagging character, like written terribly. I mean, the, the actress does the best she can with what she's yeah. given, but, um, and this, this like useless husband and like it seems like this part of the movie lasts forever it's probably only five or ten minutes but like we clearly don't care about these people at all we're like waiting for the movie Mm -hmm. to get going and that's where i really felt what you're talking about tyler like the that thing where it, it's just like they're just filling time. Right. Like this movie just needed to pad out its runtime a little bit. My favorite joke during that portion was uh, the actor literally chewing the scenery. <laughs> he's oh, where he just he like walks by. around and yeah, yeah. I, I was partial to the part where he uh, sits on the toilet and drops a deuce right in front yeah. of the camera for some. Like what the hell? <laughs> he what are scared. you guys doing? Come he on. gets scared, runs into the house hits the can and it's just like well i guess that's a normal human reaction <laughs> thankfully that wasn't in 3d yet yeah really <laughs> but um, with, so this ben it takes place exactly like minutes after part two i don't know if uh i love that fact picked up about on the that movie. yeah <laughs> she's watching the murders that occurred in part two on the tv and part two i think takes place five years after the first one. Oh wow so it's uh it's very tightly knit mythology here. I thought it was, a little, I mean, now that you bring that up, <laughs> I thought it was, it was slightly strange that she's watching this news, you know, broadcast about these grisly murders that are happening, happening in Crystal Lake, uh, Crystal Lake, which I imagine is like a pretty small community. Mm-hmm. And she does not, not only like doesn't mention the fact of what she's just witnessed on TV to her husband, but like doesn't seem worried at all herself. <laughs> and like, I, you know, if there's a murder, murderer on the loose in you know a a part a a small town with like a population of 50 you have to assume just like the odds are not in your favor at that moment so you would think that she would be like she would have her guard up a little bit but uh no 
Yeah, it's not uh, good. <laughs> not <laughs> ideal. Uh, okay, so the, the the kids roll into town, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's this whole, like, I don't sex... even think they're in Crystal Lake at this one. I think they're Crystal Lake adjacent. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Adjacent. <laughs> Yeah. all right i don't know if they're i don't know because it's end. like it's like crystal pond because they aren't at the lake they're higgins haven it's called yeah i think that's just the name of her little cabin like you yeah. know sometimes people give their homes weird names especially yeah. out in the middle of nowhere i think it's supposed to be on crystal lake um, oh, okay uh, but i think yeah the higgins haven is just like a nickname for her her cabin I, that's how i read it anyway but mm. um, it definitely feels like a sound stage like they didn't really film it in the the woods <laughs> yeah that uh Maybe that's what's missing that cabin is pretty nice it's got that spiral staircase and everything yeah. like, you don't really see that in uh in too many uh lakefront cabins but... and there's like and there's like this little bit of history that we don't know about between the two characters uh rick and uh, uh vera yeah. is it, no chrissy i think oh, okay um and it is kind of interesting. It kind of unfolds over the movie because you're like, are we supposed to know these characters? And okay, then... that's interesting because I did not rewatch the first two entries before watching this. And I was mm-hmm. wondering if that was something that was played up in no. the, the previous films, but it sounds like it wasn't. So that's uh, that's an interesting little nod. And and like talking about Rick, that guy sucks. Like yeah. <laughs> he's just yeah. constantly <laughs> negging the lead and like just, I mean, Who's he's bang, obvi- yeah, like obviously all about sex and like that's, that's like a, um, a Red running, <laughs> well, it, it, certainly, but it's like a running theme throughout these movies, right? Like, yeah, th- this is like maybe the franchise when it comes to, um, you know, the, the whole idea of like, uh, cabin in the woods movies and like, you know, all the stuff that like people make fun of and, and all these tropes that have formed and like people point out in movies like scream and stuff like that. It seems like the Friday the 13th franchise is really like, the primary one that everybody's drawing from that sort of originated all these, these tropes, or at least if not originated, at least popularized. So, yeah. um, yeah, I, I found that to be a little bit interesting, but yeah, Rick, I mean, that guy, <laughs> he is really terrible. So I'm, I was glad to see him, uh, go, but yeah, his, his constant fascination with sex and just like obsession with it, like it's commented on in the movie. Like, I think it's, it's the Chrissy characters like sex, 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 you guys are getting boring. And I thought that was like a, a commentary on the state of the genre. It almost has like this self lo- uh, self loathing kind of thing where I, I felt like the writers of this movie were like, you know, we would like to move on. And then this is me right. projecting onto them, but it was like, right. we would like to move on and like write something else. Uh, but we know that this is what sells and this is what, you know, <laughs> sort of like we have to hit these beats in a movie like this. Um, David, what do you make of that? Yeah, it feels like almost, uh, maybe like some studio intervention or something already early on in the series was telling them what to do. And, and they just kind of had to, they really didn't have a choice. Like that's what sells these summer movies with sex and, and kills. And it has to be that way. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was an issue with kids going to see the 3d. So they wanted to play a lot of the stuff down, even though mm, the mass murdering is probably, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not friendly for children but yeah the high body count might uh i wonder how many young that. kids went and saw it just because it was in 3d oh god um because remember I mean, in america violence is better than than sex sure right. yeah uh <laughs> one of the 3d moments that really stuck with me is like the the eyeball from the old man in yeah. the street who delivers mm-hmm. that warning like that eyeball is so um <laughs> I don't know if that's what the human eye looks like when you rip it out, but uh, that prop is really gross and grimy, and like he just like holds it right in the right down the lens. Um, I, so I thought that was uh, that was hey, someone. Like someone that? has you... that sitting in their house right now. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Spielberg or somebody <laughs> next to the Orin from Neverending Story. Oh God! Did you Ben? Did you like that character at all? That old man who sleeps on the road. Oh Can yeah, of course. Again. Yeah, I love that guy. I mean, he's, he shows up. He he throws a hundred and ten mile an hour fastball in you know two minutes of screen time, and then just walks off into the yeah. sunset. He's not murdered by Jason. Nope. Uh, so you know that guy, I think, is arguably the hero of the movie. <laughs> oh yeah, and he's kind of a recurring presence in these movies, that, that, like yeah. a different version of him each time. But that would be fascinating enough. if it was the same guy, but it's a different person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, Ralph no. Ralph gets killed in the second one. Oh, that's right, he does. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so w- one of the actors mentioned the motorcycle gang. We got to talk about that. Oh, scene, yeah. The, the convenience oh, store boy. and the 
the whole uh, thing. Like I, I, the thing that I found the craziest <laughs> about this, and I want to open the floor to you guys and have you guys talk about, about this uh, whole thing. But for me, their bikes get knocked over and they're going to retaliate by burning down the barn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like That seems like they are really, uh, you know, it's like the end of uh, Batman Begins when he's talking about like escalation and stuff like that. So they're really taking this whole thing <laughs> to an, an entirely un, like, uh, unreasonable level in terms of revenge and retaliation. But um, <laughs> what did you guys think about that sequence? Yeah, they don't have any impulse control, I think is their <laughs> issue. There's, David, there's would you join this game? Dudes. Oh, of course I would join this game. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Loco, Fox, Ali, and David Rosen, baby. Yeah, there you go. I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm just they, picturing they, what my, I, my costume would look like right now. <laughs> it was a nice little turn of uh, characters where you're kind of stuck with these six um fan dwellers and then all of a sudden there's just in crystal lake alone this like sleepy town there's just a ra- raging gang problem <laughs> it's only three people yeah and and ali like i mean we can jump around a little bit i was really surprised when he springs back to life briefly yeah. at the very end of the movie because it really made it seem like jason was just bashing his skull in. Yeah. and i was like in, in the moment when you know halfway through the movie when he seemingly gets taken out i was like god this is like I know what's happening off screen, but like the idea of what's happening to him seems more brutal than a lot of the other kills that have happened so far in this movie. And then like, you know, whatever hours later within the, uh, the, the timeline of this film, he just like pops back up and (laughs) he seems totally fine. Like Jason in my memory is not normally that bad at taking care of business, but uh, he really blew it on that one. Yeah. I I don't want to, I don't want to, Oh, I don't want to speculate too much, but uh, I imagine the writer felt like they struck gold with that moment. Like, oh, this is going to blow everyone's mind that Ali's still here. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) definitely has that feeling. It's uh, it was I don't know that that gang came back for for some reason. I thought it was a different group of gang members, but I think there's a different group of gang members in one of these other movies. I can't Mm. recall. (laughs) But uh, David, you would probably be able to tell us, do gang members show up a lot in the later entries? I can't. Uh... Well, certainly uh, Manhattan. Um, That's but right. Yeah, but I don't know about any other ones, but there's definitely okay. a really funny uh, scene with gang members in Manhattan. So um, I don't know. I, I think maybe because it was the 80s, people were generally worried about inner city gangs affecting like farmland communities. So that's probably <laughs> the warriors why in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I feel like people are still scared about that. So um, I guess that's just uh, rural drama there for you. Yeah. Although I do remember my grandma talking. We live in like a sleepy Illinois or we we come from a sleepy Illinois town. And there's like this legend of the night the Hell's Angels rolled through and everyone oh, wow. was just scared to, uh, you know, to come outside and they all lock their doors. And it's like, man, really? Nothing really goes on around here. <laughs> Uh, so maybe they were pulling from some sort of real life experience. Yeah, too, yeah maybe they saw 13.3. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to mention uh, Psycho because I feel like we can't talk about this movie oh, without yeah. talking about Psycho because, and, and David, you probably can speak to this because of the whole, like the premise of your podcast, like the idea mm-hmm. of influences, you know, being uh, recurring throughout cinematic history. It feels like Psycho is a, a really big um, inspiration for this movie, just in terms of like the, uh, you know, the very beginning, especially you see like the, the, uh, beheaded, uh, mother, like the, I don't know exactly what was going on with the body in that situation. Cause it's been a while since I've rewatched part two, but like the, the mother shrine and, and that whole thing. And then you've got like the, uh, the shower sequence that happens later in this movie, which seems like a direct, uh, homage. Do you want to speak to that for a second? Sure. Yeah. I, you know, and that's the the funny thing about like the slasher genre is, you know, there really wasn't that much to pull from yet. And that's why I think Friday the 13th itself is so influential and so easy to see a lot of parallels with things that have come later. Psycho is definitely one of the few before that uh, definitely, you know, I think you can see its fingerprints all over this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Jason has mommy issues because he we're not really sure if he. And maybe you guys can explain it to me. Did he live in the lake for like 30 years before coming out as full grown Jason? Or did he survive and just live in the woods 
and then watch his mom get beheaded in the first one. Um, and then in part two, Ben, the uh, character from the recap, uh, I can't remember her name now, but she kind of explains psychologically what he's going through, which mm. I always thought was kind of interesting, where he sees his mom decapitated, doesn't know how death works because he's lived in the woods most of his life and become like a... A recluse. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and the idea that he, because he doesn't understand how death works, he just like creates a shrine to his mom's head, mm. <laughs> thinking that maybe she'll come back to life if he brings enough bodies to her. Uh, but then he know like in part three, like he understands how other things work. Like he understands how when he closes the barn door and puts the little thing over it right to keep it locked like okay so you understand how that works um so it's it's always like a question of how much does jason understand um can he comprehend other things as well as maybe or he he just likes it i don't know yeah interesting (laughs) but i always Um, i always like that part in part two where the psychological uh reasoning behind his killings is like oh maybe he thinks that'll bring his mom back who knows yeah. And, and talking about uh, homages and influences and stuff, there's that one moment where um, Jason uses the ax to break into the closet. I thought it was a pretty clear homage to The Shining. Um, sure. It's a yep. really famous uh, <laughs> shot from that film. Um, and yeah, that's a guy. That's a good point. I hadn't really thought about that, um, David, like the idea that this is 1982 and like Psycho came out in what, like the early 60s, mid 60s, something like that. Yeah. Um, 1960. And Oh, 1960. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like there'd really only been, you know, like, yeah, like 20 years worth of, of um, like, I guess modern, if you want to call it like a modern horror movie, of course there had been like universal monsters and stuff like that before, but like in terms of the slasher genre, like that hadn't really been um, like fully established yet at this point. So there, there really wasn't much that they could riff on. They were sort of like creating a lot of their own stuff. Exactly. Um, so yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, the only other real note that I had written down here that I wanted to talk about is like, I, aside from the 3d aspects, which we've, we've touched on a little bit and, mm. and you know, those are like relatively entertaining. I actually liked the, uh, the harpoon one, like coming straight at the camera. I yeah. thought that was maybe like the most effective of all sure. of them. Um, I, I think the cinematography is kind of basic in this movie. Like it's, it's functional, but frankly, I kind of f- found the the look of the movie to be pretty boring. But things for me started to get a little bit better as the ending approached. And mm-hmm. I thought one of the best shots in the movie was when the camera actually pulls back to reveal something interesting. There's this moment where Chrissy walks out onto the porch when the wind is whipping up and she's calling out for Rick. And the camera pulls back to reveal that Jason is holding Rick with a hand over his mouth just around the corner, like right out of her sight line. And I thought that was a kind of a cool thing. Like that same kind of thing happened a little bit, uh, a few minutes later, there's this, she enters the barn and tries to bar the door behind her. And there's this really long shot of Jason coming in and breaking in and like lifting the blockade, looking around for her. And all in one shot, the camera sort of cranes up to look at him from above and pans over to show Chrissy hiding in the rafters. And I just thought that, you know, it, it was like those two shots come really late in the movie. And I'm like, where has this been the whole film? Like, you know, right. use the camera to do something interesting and like reveal information to me and show me the geography of the things instead of just like these sort of like, I guess, just standard boring, like locked off shots, you know, like the, I just didn't think there was very much going on uh, in the movie when they, I, I feel like the movie could have been a lot more dynamic if they had, chosen to shoot it a different way because the story itself is pretty simple but i thought the the execution of it was also simple and i wished that they had like been able to sort of take it up a notch but i wonder what you guys thought about that did you think that maybe that simplicity actually ended up helping the movie or or do you uh, also sort of harbor that desire for them to have gone a little further with it i'm go david do you have any thoughts well, I was just going to say uh, that I think it kind of mirrors what the actor was saying about, you know, 3D being more important than actual, uh, you know, getting the dialogue or getting the takes right or anything like that. I think that there was just like a, a very just kind of lazy to to the way that things were put together, where it was like the important thing is like just to have a couple of thrills and then string the rest of it together. Yeah. Yeah, I think script wise, the ending was like the bulk of the ideas so you know they probably had like oh well this would be really cool in the movie and it starts when 
that storm begins. Cause when that storm starts and everything's blown around, like things really get amped up a little bit as opposed to like the sleepy time, um, campsite that we've kind of spent an hour and 15 minutes in. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was the idea they had, like, wouldn't it be cool if like the storms blowing and, you know, Jason's got his mask on or whatever. And then everything else before that is just, well, we have to make a movie. So I guess, you know, they go to the, (laughs) they go to the, the grocery store or whatever. And then there are these people and their laundries hanging. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Throw that in. And, uh, no, this, this, and it's also the most confusing ending too, because, uh, spoiler alert, um, Jason's mom pops out of crystal pond or whatever this place is called. <laughs> right. And, uh, fully recapitated. Um, <laughs> so I've I, I heard don't know that term you, before. I don't know if you guys <laughs> understand, like, uh, and, and by the way, David knows this. She never returns. Like this isn't like a thing that comes back in part four. Right. Um, so I don't, <laughs> there's always uh, this ending dream sequence where you think it it's happening, but then maybe it doesn't, but who knows? Cause at the, at the recap, I don't know who cares. It's just <laughs> during the, during the recap, like they show uh, Jason like crawl away, which means that the sequence at the end of part two may or may not have happened where he jumps through the window. Hmm. Um, I don't know. An unreliable narrator. Maybe. What uh, did you think mm-hmm. of the recapitated uh, Pamela Voorhees? Scary, not scary, Ben. Uh, David, I, I want to go to you first. <laughs> Well, it, it's it's rehashing. I mean, and I, yeah. I think that there's there's some fun stuff in this movie. So it's like so unnecessary to like lean on. Hey, remember that scary scene from the first one? Let's do that again. Like, there's just no need for it. Does that happen in all three of the first three entries? The thing with the somebody jumping up out of the canoe, or is it just the end of the first one? There's like Hello, a scene remember? like it. Yeah, and the, and the yeah. one she's in a canoe. And Jason, the boy, jumps out. In part two, he, like, jumps through the window. You think everything's fine. He, like, jumps through the window without his pillowcase on. So you get to see kind of his face. Okay. And then this one, they were like, well, who's going to jump up this time? And I guess they yeah. went with the <laughs> the mom. Yeah, it just felt like they were retreading the same ground. Like, yeah, just, like, rehashing, you know, familiar stuff. And, like, I mean, I guess there's a fun way to do that. Um, but maybe this early in the franchise, it, it feels a little desperate or a little bit more desperate than maybe it would have if they, you know, came, if they held off and, like, showed some restraint yeah. and, like, maybe did that in, like, the fifth entry or something. And it's like, oh, cool, now it's a, a shout-out to something that happened you know, 10 years ago, as opposed to something that like just, you know, right. <laughs> that audiences like have like, comp- uh, you know, relatively speaking, have just seen. Um, but that's, that's but, easy for us to say, because I can watch all three in a row right, right now, as opposed to, you know, like you want, you watch the first one in 1980, and then your nerves calm for a year. And then you go part two, and you go, oh, <laughs> it got me again. And then you ca- your nerves calm again. And then there's all the like 12 year olds that have been talking about Friday the 13th for two years that they haven't seen the first two. So then they go and see three. So they're scared for the first time. So I don't know, maybe it scared a bunch more people than we think it did. Yeah. I think I, think I read also that this was really intended to be the last one. Like they didn't plan on going forward, but then it made a lot of money. So they did. I wonder if oh. that's why they left Jason motionless at the end when the camera mm-hmm. sort of like pans back away from him because they were thinking about, I, I had not heard that, but that makes a lot of sense, you know, cause I, I was expecting there to be, I was like scanning his body rapidly as the camera was moving, like waiting for like a finger twitch or like some little, you know, eyeball to shoot back open or whatever the hell. Um, and they didn't do that. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. And I guess, I, yeah, that makes sense if they were like, all right, this is the last one. And then, I mean, the movie, that's the thing. The movie was made for $2 million, basically $2.2 million budget. And it made $37 million in the U S alone. Holy shit. So they, they were basically <laughs> nice. like forced into making more because it, right. it like didn't make financial sense not to <laughs> like, right. they had to do it regardless of even what the idea was they had to do it. So, um, I I mean, that's the thing too, where you sort of feel it in, in these franchises that are running like this, especially in the early eighties, I feel like where, um, there's like almost a sense of disdain sometimes that comes through from the people who are making it who are like, damn it. I really want to be making my passion project, but these friggin' movies are just making so much money. I have to do this to like pay the rent or whatever. So, um, I yeah, I, that I think... job though. <laughs> <laughs> I got um, so many places for Jason to go. 
<laughs> Jason takes be... London. Jason takes Hong Kong. Jason takes Sydney, Australia. Like a surfing Jason. Takes Jason. Vegas. Bring <laughs> yeah. him here. Bring him here. Jason takes Vegas. Oh, yeah. oh man. The Jason well, in LA Crocodile Dundee in LA crossover we've always wanted. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler, if you can make it for two point two million dollars, maybe Hollywood will uh will come calling. So. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you imagine like Jason surfing? And like another surfer in the in the rip rip curl and like decapitating the other surfer, <laughs> the, the body and the it just comes out the other end yeah. and, and it doesn't have a head on it. Exactly. Oh Love my it. god, yeah. I can see it now. Love it. And you get Paul Hogan to cameo. He's on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> the lots of surf. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, we'll so I think, that. yeah, yeah, needs a little work. Um, I, I, think, I think that's all the the major notes that I had written down. Was there anything else that you guys wanted to touch on um, with this entry specifically? Uh, David, you go first. Yes, there's a big thing actually that we didn't touch on. Um, that opening theme music, which oh, yeah. is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, was it Harry Manfredini? I believe his name is. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, getting a chance to just go full out disco. Um, that, that music is just so fun and funky and great. Uh, it's like, just, just, a like a synth, synth pop dance horror thing. It, it, it almost reminds me a little bit of thriller. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Is he like best known for his work in, in this franchise? Is that, oh yeah, he scored the whole franchise. Um, which wow. normally is obviously, you know, more, you know, orchestral type stuff, but, uh, I guess to go along with the 3d, they, they said, you know, give this thing a, you know, funky beat. Um, <laughs> but yeah, normally it's more orchestral, this stuff he does. That's cool. Um, Tyler, do you have anything that uh, you wanted to hit? No, I think we got to everything. I wanted to talk about uh, the uh, the 3D effects and if they hold up. And um, I wanted uh, David to be on because we're doing our own Freddy versus Jason style crossover episodes. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed this one. I, it's a little boring for a while, but then it comes back uh, strong for the ending. So uh, if it you've never seen it. Sure. If you've never seen any Friday the Thirteenth movies, this one wouldn't be it wouldn't be crazy to start with this one. I think, right? Because yeah, it, it gives a recap and it kind of explains what what it's all about. I think the one thing we didn't mention was the um, interaction she had with Jason, like flashback. Um, the flashback she had of him like trying to assault oh, her. Right where she's like recounting it and there's like yeah. the, the crossfade going on with the visuals. Yeah. Kind of giving the, the impression that he's been like on the loose for years, even mm-hmm. though movie wise, we've only seen him like once. Right. Um, so this would be a good one to kind of start and get an idea of whether you want to take the trek through movie history. <laughs> I think that's a really good point because the first two are, you know, pretty slow and they, they have their moments and they, you know, they have their rightful place and, you know, horror history. But uh, this is when the series really starts to become, you know, what you think of when you think of Friday the 13th is I think it starts here and especially with him getting the hockey mask here. And then the fourth one, I think, is one of the best. So, I mean, you're you're going up from there and then maybe a little bit down but uh then it bounces around from that point forward i just saw that there was one more note that i had and and i really wish i would have brought this up earlier because i don't want to end on this but uh i have to mention it the you would think that the pregnant girl would be safe but no think again she gets murdered in this movie and the film like does not mention it or linger on it in any way they just like sort of like offhandedly mention in the beginning like oh i'm pregnant whatever and then she uh, you know for the entire movie i'm like okay she's the only one who's gonna make it out alive and then she's like stabbed through the chest from like uh, with this knife from underneath a hammock or something i think that's how she dies and i was just like jesus christ like they have no compunction about killing a pregnant woman on screen like i don't think that's something that even that anyone would do now, like in modern day Hollywood. But in 1982, apparently that was just something where they were just like, Oh yeah, no big deal. We're just going to do this. So <laughs> to be, Maybe they, I, forgot. I think, they think they forgot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never brought up again. So <laughs> like, oops. Uh, uh, yeah. We've, 
Yeah. That would actually make me feel way better about the entire situation if they just <laughs> genuinely forgot that they mentioned that. So uh, that, I, I found that to be like the most disturbing aspect of this entire movie. Like, Jesus, like the the uh, lack of humanity on display here is like really <laughs> brutal. But um, the bad guy. All right. <laughs> Uh, Tyler, do you want to, uh, do you want to, oh. I guess for our audience, do you want to tell people what the deal is with the, uh, well, you the just heard, three goal? you just heard him, um, fly by, uh, the three goal is our, uh, delivery system that we use to, uh, give the listeners a little hint to which movie we might be listening to next time. Of course, uh, NJ and M to the third power, um, does not have, you don't have to listen to any episodes in order. They're all kind of self sustaining uh installments but would you try to give a little hint to those that maybe are listening um one after another and, and uh, uh, then the you three oh, man, it, it what? dropped a, a piece and of I paper again yeah and i, I managed to Drop snag it. it out of the sky uh and it's a very small like a, a raven-esque little little scroll here and it yeah. just has one quote on it and the quote is from kevin carr from 7m pictures it looks like a, mm. a section of a movie review and it says, sure, there's still the 71 Hemi Cuda and the four barrel shotgun, but it's not enough to get past nunchucks and biker zombies. Whoa. So I, I guess that will give us and, and maybe our audience a hint at one of the, the upcoming movies that, that we're going to be watching for this, uh, this miniseries. That sounds awesome. David, do you have any guesses? I am not sure, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> we'll I would be tune in. incredibly impressed if you knew it based yeah, me too. on that, just like <laughs> off the top of your head. But I think uh, he would dethrone us at that point, wouldn't he? He would just like, this would be his show now. Yeah, yeah my podcast, just, no. We would have to seed, yeah, seed control for sure. Um, okay, so uh, let's wrap this thing up. Let's put this thing to bed, guys. Uh, David, where can people find you and your work online? I know you mentioned it earlier, but uh, tell folks again in case they're interested in, in tracking down your podcast and maybe some of your music stuff as well. Sure. You can find Piecing It Together wherever you listen to podcasts and at piecingpod.com. And we're on social media at piecingpod. And you can find my music on iTunes and all the big music sites. Uh, just search for David Rosen or go to my website, bydavidrosen.com. Tyler, what about you? Uh, you can find my nonsense. The uh, five cast Twitter is now at Space Whale 2020X. Um, because I'm a space whale now, and uh, and then at NJNM Podcast is where you'll. I don't use that one as much, but that's where you'll get uh, links to, let's say, the RSS feeds and all that stuff. So check it out there. Sure, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ben Pears. You can find me writing at SlashFilm.com. And like I mentioned, you can find all the episodes of this podcast at NJNM pod. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. NJNM podcast.blogspot.com. So uh, shoot us an email at not just new movies at gmail.com. If you have any commentary, any questions, concerns, anything like that. Um, special thank you to David for dropping by and hanging out with us. This was really fun, man. I appreciate you coming by. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you all for listening. We will talk to you guys next time. <laughs>